I am so amazed as you turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17, how so easily you can be discouraged. <laughs> I'm amazed that I come from a, across the tracks, you could say. A great sinner. Loved every bit of it. I lied. I had more funny one man could shake. And you, you did too, Wayne. We know that sin is fun. It Jesus said it's pleasure. But the wages of his death. I, I, I've always been amazed at how easily the body of Christ and ministers can be disappointed and discouraged when this Bible is like a Broadway play that the actors change. It's the longest running play ever. And we all have our character parts. We're all character actors. You, you got to understand something about me. I am not a funny man. I'm not. When God saved me, I wasn't funny. Uh, I'm, I'm a businessman in my thinking. I really am. I, 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 I don't just, I, I meditate. I think before I move on something because I promised myself that what I would start, I wouldn't be a fool and not finish. See what I'm saying? Got to finish. That's been in my mind since I can remember as a child growing up. Because I saw my parents never finish nothing. I saw the church never finish nothing. Yet I saw God say, it's finished. That really touched me in the script. I said, I got to finish what I start. So before I start something, I really think about it. And I, 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 let me go back to this. I'm so amazed at how many people get discouraged so easily when you know the end of the play. When you know the end result. When God called me to the ministry, which I didn't want to go. I was doing good before he ever called me. I needed none of this. I ran away from this, to tell you the truth. When I got born again, I've lived in spotlights. I believe I couldn't move. If I, if I was in a nightclub, a spotlight would follow me or whatever. I, I, I never wanted any of this. Let you have it. Because there's such a great price to pay for these lights. And I'm not talking about the purchase of TV. But I'm talking about the, well, the world looking at you. I mean, everything you do. Mm -hmm. Even though you're behind closed door, the door is a glass door. People see. I never wanted any of this. Now, when God called me, he said, I'm going to do something unique with this boy. Call me a boy. Well, I was a boy. And I thought, I wanted to be a dramatic preacher. I wanted homiletics, hermeneutics, philosophy, theology. I like E equals MC square. That interests me. I want to know why. And I want to know how. I don't like coming and just getting my ears tickled. I don't like just having a good night and a good week. I want results. I'm result minded. In anything that I do. I do my best. And I do not like to be patronized. Now, my best may not be good enough for you, but my God, if it's my best, it's good enough for God. So I, I, I could care less what people say about me or call me because I don't answer to it. Because it isn't me. And God said, I'm going to do something unique to a boy who's never had this. I'm going to give him a gift called humor. Did not know it was coming. It was a surprise thing. <laughs> then I realized God needed to laugh. <laughs> because he got some disobedient kids. The difference between a mama and a daddy is a daddy loves creating kids, but he don't like being around them. <laughs> it's the truth. You can only stay so long with your family. And they say, you got to go see your mama, boy. You kind of like the big lion and the pride. You always kind of away from the girls. Then here come the cub. Ah, get on out of here. <laughs> Go back to your mama. You seen that commercial about the J.C. Penny? <laughs> Day out. 
And there's this man eating and his child throwing food at him. And he looks at the baby and says, where's your mama? <laughs> we, have, we don't have a patience level as much. So God birthed this into me in 1976 on a January. I believe January the 4th, I preached my first message. There's nobody, there was nobody like me. It's not fun being different because the smiles usually are birthed out of persecution. The greatest clowns have had the greatest sadness. It's much easier to be a dramatic actor than it is to be a comedian, to do comedy. Because, buddy, when you fall on your face with comedy, you bit the dust. You see? And God dropped this, gave me three gifts in my life. He gave me the gift of increase, everything I touch prosper. Everything I do is under budget. Everything I get, I always get back. Is that arrogance? No, that's the truth. God is looking for somebody who will take the persecution of being rich. You're going to get persecuted. It's going to happen. God is looking for the person who's willing to take the persecution of a hundredfold belief in your life. You're going to get persecuted but you're going to get your job done because this is an economic world. He gave me the gift of joy. You cannot, you cannot offend me. I didn't say you couldn't hurt my feelings. You can hurt my feelings, but you'll never know it because joy is my strength. And he gave me that gift of humor, but I wanted to be a dramatic actor. I can preach like T.D. Jakes. I'm a white man that can do a hoop. <laughs> and the Lord said, huh. come on. I mean, I can flow, Joe. Oh, Lord. My favorite music was Motown. Talk to me. Come on. Yeah. I was never into today. I passed you on the street. <laughs> I left that to Happy Caldwell. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Let old happy have that song. <laughs> God chooses really unique people to do unique things. I don't have a spirit of competition. Oh, when I hear somebody's blessed, I go, hey, glory to God. I'm not in competition with nobody. I'm in cooperation with everybody. I'm on your side. I'm with you. You understand? I'm with you. I'm for you. Why? I, I'm an encourager. Why? Because I've been disappointed. Do you know how heavy discouragement is? So I would rather encourage you in the endeavor that God calls you to do. I want you to succeed. But beyond success, I want you to prosper. I want you to be debt free, but you can be debt free and broke. <laughs> Still living in that trailer. Nothing wrong with a trailer. A wonderful, wonderful, wonderful home, especially in the hurricane country. You don't have to board up. Just hook up. Take the house with you when you leave. Come on back. But I also want you to be debt-free and prosperous. There's a difference there. You know, there's levels to these things. So when I hear somebody's being blessed and George Myers came down to New Orleans and I had the opportunity to just be with her just one day. We went out to eat lunch and we're talking about the wonderful things God has done. And I rejoice. I didn't say, well, Lord, why, 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 why did he do that for me? He did it for me when he did it for her. Yeah. We're on the same team. I, I don't have to be the quarterback. I'll just be the water boy. I'm going to get the jacket. I want the jacket because the girls don't look at what you do. They just look at the jacket. <laughs> You get that jacket, they think you something. You know what I'm saying? So I'm excited. And I, I'm amazed at the competitive jealousy in the body of Christ. And how easy you can be discouraged when this great play is in its final act. And you've seen the end result. You know how it's going to end. First Samuel chapter 17. Saul has been destroyed and God, right before he's destroyed, he's like you see, being prophet, king and whatever things. And, but see, God's always got a second man. There's a, always someone that no one really wants to pick. And let me just say this little preamble before I get into this. 
So God sends this same Samuel guy down to a man's house named Jesse. <laughs> Jesse got a lot of sons. Looked like kings. His eldest boy looked like a king. His elder boy has the body of a king. The demeanor of a king. The stature. He looks right. Looks just like Saul, doesn't he? Mm. He says, Jesse, God sent me here because out of your house will be the next king of Israel. He has chosen you. Jesse's excited. Line my boys up. Line them all up. That's Eliab. Why can't he be king? What's his problem? Jealousy. He's got it in him. It's not exposed there, but it will be exposed. It will come out. Samuel's disappointed. Have you ever been disappointed? You knew God told you something going to happen, and then all of a sudden, there you are in the happening, and it isn't happening. So he says, Jesse, you got any, any other kids? <laughs> yeah, I do, but we, we, don't let, we don't let this boy come in the house very much. <laughs> well, why? He's a musician. And he got strawberry red hair. <laughs> you know, he sings to sheep. <laughs> He's a poet, and he don't even know it. <laughs> we don't let him come in the house very much. You don't want to see this boy. He's athletically built, but he's weird. <laughs> he writes songs. He sings to sheep. When a man loves a sheep, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> I don't know. Can't keep his mind on nothing else. We don't let him come in the house very much. <laughs> Go get him. David! Uh-huh. Your daddy wants you. You've got to be kidding me. You want me? Because he really loves his daddy, but his daddy doesn't pay that much attention to it. Because he's got Eliab on his mind. So here come David. What's up, Sam? How you doing, Big E? What y'all want with me? Sam, you see him. He says, you got to be kidding me. God said, get your oil out. I'm going to give him the gift of kingship today. And if you don't think he was something, Jesus never called himself the son of Moses. He called himself the son of David. Why? Musician. strange because you only see his outside. You don't see the quality, the tenacity, the loyalty, the ability to do these things. He anoints him, but that don't change nobody's mind to David because I don't care how much fresh oil you got. I don't care how many oil changes you've had. You can't become king in people's eyes. In God, you can. But in people's eyes, you got to do something. Nobody accepted George W. Bush as president of the United States until he made that speech before the Congress, which I think is the greatest speech of any president I've ever heard in my life. And one of the commentators said this. He won the Florida recount tonight. Very simple, man. You understand him easily. What do you think about Osama? Wanted, dead or alive. <laughs> okay. We can figure that out. We're in hot pursuit. We will bring him to justice. Oh, the other thing. The justice will come to him. Or bring justice to him. He won the Florida recount. He became president of the United States right there. All the liberals said, okay. <laughs> a unique man. You don't bring the head of a country called Russia and put him in your pickup truck.
unless you have a relationship with this man. Not only politically, but behind the doors. He's likable. But he don't look like a president. According to the world standard. Oh, but according to God, he does. Now, I'm not being political. I'm just saying it. That's what's happened. David, they said, go on back to the sheep, boy. I don't care how much all on you. You still nothing but a strawberry red-headed singing sheep boy. <laughs> but a war starts. Satan has got to fight you. He's so insane, he will fight himself. So Jesse calls him again. You don't hear Jesse talk much to David at all. He said, your brothers need some cheese. Some cheese and some bread. And then, you know, I want you to bring them on down there and feed them boys. He said, okay, dad. No problem. I'll go down there. So he goes. And 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle. And were gathered together at Shoko, whatever that is. Which belongeth to Judah. And pitched between Shoko. And Azekai in, now whatever that is, I don't know. <laughs> Verse 2. <laughs> hey, this is my meeting. I'm going to do it the way I want. <laughs> and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Eli. And set the battle in array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and they just stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them. Now, I see, all they see is two armies. God sees two kingdoms. One that serves Dagon, and the other one that serves Jehovah. Notice that Dagon always seems to have better equipment and bigger people. And I'll prove that a little bit later. On the other side of the valley is the kingdom of Jehovah. Elohim. Yahweh. Mm. But between Jehovah and Dagon is Goliath. Even the name sounds big. Goliath. Both armies are afraid. A lot of people didn't run. Philistines just afraid because they ain't crossing that valley unless Goliath go first. So they have a champion. In that day and time, they had champions. So he comes out and he spouts off at the mouth. God lets us see how big his helmet. The boy's head was as big as a microwave. <laughs> boy had a big head. Big as a microwave. This boy big. And he says all that. And he, says, and he goes on. In verse 18, after all he's done popped off at the mouth, Jesse says, carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousand. Look there that thy brother and fair and take their pledge. Verse 19, now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Eli fighting with the Philistines. And David rose up early in the morning, left the sheep with a keeper. Took and went as Jesse had commanded him and he came to the trench. So it's trench warfare. As the host was going forth to the, bat, to the fight and shouted for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array. Army against army or kingdom against kingdom. David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army. He ran and came and saluted his brother. In other words, he's a teenager. He's been singing the sheep. Now he gets to talk to some people. What's up, God? Hey! <laughs> Typical teenager. You don't care what's going on. Don't make no difference. I'm here. Have no fear. David's here. How y'all doing? <laughs> I got some cheese for you. <laughs> and as he talked with them, oh, oh, he know how to talk. People like him. He's a good guy. He talked with him. Behold, there came the champion, the Philistine of Goth. Goliath by name out of the armies of the Philistines spake according to the same works. And David heard them. So he heard Goliath flapping his jaw. They're talking this trash. Hmm. 
And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were so afraid. And the men of Israel said, listen, man, well, if somebody goes out there and take care of this guy, the king will bless him. Now, why don't the king go out there? He's a head and shoulder taller than anybody else. But see, he got sense, enough sense to know he done lost out with God. And when you're that point in your life, you don't care how many people sac you sacrifice for your own self-preservation. Verse 26, David spake to the men that stood by him saying, what shall be done to the man that killed this Philistine and take away the reproach from Israel? Teenagers don't do nothing unless you pay them. <laughs> or in other words, what I get? Now watch this. You got to understand. A covenant is, be, is coming out of this boy. Here is a quality that no one has ever thought of while they've been out there looking at each other eye to eye. He says this, David spoke to the men that stood by him saying, what shall be done of this man that killed this Philistine and take away the reproach? So he knows it's a reproach to allow that fool to talk to us like this. Fool is this uncircumcised Philistine. This is a covenant boy. This is a man of loyalty. God, this is a Jesus quality. I'll never leave you, forsake you. He says, we got a problem here. This is an uncircumcised, uncovenant, I don't care how big he is. That he should defy the armors of the living God. Now that was a shot to Dagon, because all Dagon knows is a statue. People answered him after this man said, so shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And they told him, if you kill this guy, you get a woman. You don't tell that to a 17 year old boy. Because his hormones kicked up pretty strong. He's thinking, my God, the Lord had blessed me today. <laughs> this is hundredfold. I've been believing God. Thank you. It's my day. <laughs> Jesse can't say nothing because the king going to give it to her. <laughs> now watch this. Why wasn't Eliab chosen? Right here. Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. What kindled it? Envy. Jealousy. He saw David anointed. And he said, why came us down here? With whom has thou left those few sheep? In the wilderness. I know your pride. Really? And the naughtiness of thine heart. Really? How can you? Your heart so full of jealousy and enviousness and competitiveness. For thou art come down that thou might see the battle. In other words, he's saying this. You come down here just to see us lose. If you're going to lose, it's better that most people don't see you lose. That's why you never tell people how many times you prayed for somebody that didn't get healed. That's what Pat, Brother, Dave, uh, Brother Dennis said. You know the outcome. Why? Because if it was any other way, we ain't saying nothing. <laughs> Nobody likes that. Hang on. Now David says this. What have I now done? Now, how many times Eliab has spoken to that boy about different stuff? Now what I've done. Then he says, he looks at his other brother. Is there not a cause? What's wrong with you? You're looking at me when you ought to be looking at that big fool out there talking, flipping his lip. What are you looking at me for? Why am I such a threat to you? I'm your youngest brother. I really love you. But why, why are you threatened by me? So that's the problem with a lot of ministry. That's why sometimes people don't love you. Because they threaten by you. You might just get one step higher than them. And it's in front of a bunch of people. And you don't want nobody to know that you're scared. Now, you know, I could read this whole chapter. But I want to go to this. And it's a big chapter. Verse 32. David said to Saul, let no man heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight this Philistine. Now, underline that in your Bible. Go to verse 47. Underline this statement. For the battle is the Lord's. Underline that. Okay, you got that. Notice, is there not a cause? Let no man's heart fail. I'm going to take care of this boy. Fight you want, fight you going to get today. No man know what Goliath says. Verse 47. The, what makes him so assured? 
It's not his battle. How many battles are you fighting that are not God's? You ought to write that down. For the battle is the Lord. But go back to verse 38. I'm getting ahead of myself. Saul sees this boy and he thinks he's a punk kid. This boy popping his lip. He don't know any better. He knows enough to believe. Have you come so deep that you've drowned? That you forgot the very simple principles of why you are what you are and why you believe what you believe? Have you got so deep you drowned? Have you been so used to being king you don't even realize that you're lying, disobeying, and not understanding the principles of God because you think you've arrived because you seem like you got there? Watch this. So he says, look, boy, he figured he's going to die anyway. Put on my clothes. Let me give you some armor. Look what he says. Saul armed David. Don't never let a man arm you. Saul armed David with his armor. What else can he give you? And he put a helmet of brass upon his head and also he armed him with a coat of mail. Now, do you know what he's trying to do? He's trying to make David look exactly like Goliath. You don't need to look like your enemy to defeat him. You don't have to be tattooed from your top of your head to the feet, to the bottom of your feet to touch people who have tattoos. No, I'm not guessing it, but I'm just saying you don't have to look like the enemy to fight the enemy. I want you to hear what I'm saying here. <laughs> and this is a big problem in the body of Christ because we're all trying to look the same. And it cannot be. Why? For the, this next statement. Saul armed him. Put the helmet up. Verse, verse 39. David took it. He, he submitted to authority. Girded his sword upon his armor. And he essayed to go for he had not, for he had not proved it. David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these. For I have not proved them. And David put them off. Always submit to authority. But never. Ever submit to control. Amen. Write that down. That will help you in your Christian life. Submit to authority. Because authority is talking to you. But when they put something on you that does not fit. And you have not proved it. Take it off. Because now you're submitting to control. And you're already controlled by the voice of the spirit of God in your life. You submit to authority, but not to control. So notice he takes them off. Why did he take them off? The title of this message today is, if the suit don't fit, it's not yours. <laughs> Write that down. If the suit don't fit, it's not yours. I wish I could be a Kenneth Copeland, but I can't, so I never have tried. I wish I could be a Jerry Seville, but I'm too tall. <laughs> Jerry has a wonderful body in that he can walk into a store. I've seen him do it. I don't know how many times. Take a suit off a rack. It fit him perfectly. Tell him what do you want? And they go, no, no, no. He said, no, no, you don't understand. Put it on. Do the cuff. Do, do, you know, do the sleeve. Do the cuff. And he's out. I can't do that. I, got, I mean, they got to work on me all. They got to cut here, cut here. So it costs me way more money to be dressed. <laughs> I don't like paying some of the prices that I pay. But. If I want this thing to fit me, it's got to be cut to me. You understand what I'm saying? That's a wonderful quality. I wish I could be like that. So I don't try to be. I wish I could be a, a Mark Barkley that can stick. I mean, that, that has that power. You know, you're safe with him. You just feel safe around Mark. You want to fight? Go ahead, Mark. You just feel safer. That's a, that's a wonderful feeling. Mark Barkley and Dennis Burke are a lot in a lot of ways. Because when Dennis gets mad, his head starts bobbing. You better get yourself out of the way because Dennis is going to knock you down. He's coming at you. I like that. Feel safe around that. Feel safe around that strength. 
Now this boy comes to town and nobody's expecting him to come. But the first thing he does is encourage. He don't know. This is before Goliath popping off his mouth. David just comes in and starts encouraging people. Listen to this. In a good cause, you must arouse enthusiasm. You must nourish courage. And you must exchange laziness for action. Now write that down. That'll help you. In a good cause. And all of us got good cause. We call to the ministry. But we're going to have to arouse some enthusiasm. We're going to have to nourish some courage. And we're going to have to exchange laziness. See, to get something done, because talking about it's great, but doing it is much harder than talking about it. See, you must always be, now, what made David a king? Listen to this. You must always be true to your own individuality. If not, you cannot be true to someone else. That's what verse 39 said. I can't wear these. This is not me, Saul. Thank you. They're beautiful clothes, but it ain't mine. So I'm going to just be me. But boy, you got a slingshot. And this is a, this guy, you seen his head? It's big as a microwave. Well, it's a bigger target to hit. Let me say it again. You must always be true to your own individuality. Or if not, you cannot be true to, some, to someone else. If you're not true to yourself, you'll never be true to anyone else. You've got to be who you are and be proud of who you are because you are not a duplication. Jerry Savelle is not a small Kenneth Copeland. Are you living in a dream world? You don't know that man. And you've never heard his tapes. You've never read his books. And you ain't been in any of his meetings. Yes, he's been influenced by Kenneth Copeland. Who hasn't? Bless God. Thank God for it. We've all been influenced by Oral Roberts. But I'm not Oral Roberts. I wish I could be. But you know what? I'm glad that I know Oral Roberts. I'm glad I know Kenneth Copeland. I'm glad I know Jerry Savelle. And if you get around Jerry, oh, you'll find individuality like you've never seen in your life. See, you're just looking at somebody else's clothes. And you want somebody else to wear somebody else's clothes. So you try to be who your people want you to be. What are you? What? Have you read the scripture that God has delivered you from people? Amen. You want to be a, set, a success? Walk in deliverance. Mm. You must always be true to your own individuality. If not, you cannot be true to someone else. That's what verse 39 is saying. Many of the battles which are waged on earth are not the Lord's. I've had people say, Justin the planet don't seem to ever have a problem. He just seemed like he works. Well. Do you know I got money? I ain't hurting at all. Glory to God. Yet I've had the devil robbed from me on average of almost $10 million a year for the last four years. You know what's the best thing happened to me in September the 9-11? Let me tell you the best thing that's happened to Justin the planet. Anthrax. I've had two thieves stealing and dumping my mail. Yes. Listen, I mean, I should sue the shoes off the United States Post Office, but they ain't got money to pay me. They're trying to hike the rate of a stamp up. <laughs> we found one, put him in jail. Found another, got rid of him. And bless God, what happened is they take my mail. They've caught him with my mail in their hands, looking for cash, opening up the envelopes. But you see, if there was no cash, there's a check in it. Well, you can't put it back in the system because then everybody caught it out. So you throw it away. And then the person that wrote the check, we won't know because they get their bank statement. It's not in their bank statement. So you think, my God, well, evidently it didn't make my bank statement. So another month goes by. Now the trail is two months old. Finally, you call and say, my check did not clear. We never received it. Somebody throwed it away. Now anthrax came. People are leery of opening letters. <laughs> A curse can be a blessing. Immediately, all thieving stopped. I'm averaging. This is an average of thirty-five to forty thousand dollars more a day coming into my ministry. This has been going on for four years. You figure it out. It's about ten million. Forty million. If I had that forty million, I could have flew here in a G5. God said, "You're gonna send anthrax." To Senator Leahy, to Tom Daschle. Can you imagine the thief? You know, people don't like preachers. Especially the ones that got a little money. Let's don't touch his mail. We ain't had one phone call since September. Whoever sent that anthrax? Thank you. Now you going to jail, sucker. 
But even out of something bad, God turned around and did something good. I'm talking an average of thirty-five to $40,000 more a day is now coming in in my ministry that I have been losing. It takes a lot of money to run this ministry. I don't talk much about it, but it does. The point is simply this. I thought, man, we did everything. Now, should we sue them? I, I thought of everything to do in four years. I didn't hear this love message very much. I know some people that are making an offer you don't refuse. They like me. They owe me some favors. I didn't sin. I just told them to sin. Well, it's just like Mark Barkley did. I don't want to use this platform for anything other, but I do have a video school. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mark. I just play it. Just play it. Got to keep that. <laughs> sound good. Kathleen on me. She said, that sounds good. I said, yeah, it does. Many of the battles which are waged in your church or in your ministry are not the Lord's. What made David a success? He said the battle is the Lord's. Let me give you something. I just wrote my partners in January and I just wrote another uh, partner letter in February. God told me, he said, nothing impossible to you or for you in 2002. He said, Jesse, the only job you got is to believe that I can do my job. He said, that's why I said, you know what? A hundred folk people can't believe it because it's impossible. God ain't asking you to produce it. He's asking you to believe it. He ain't asking me to produce nothing. He just simply asking me to believe that he can do what he said. So my partner that come out in February says this. How do you spell relief? B-E-L-I-E-F. Believe. Just believe that he can. Because if he can't, we're all under. If he doesn't do the impossible, you can't even do the possible. Mm, mm. So maybe your battle's been too strong or you've been fighting something that's not God's. And he told the devil and told the whole world, he said, the battle is the Lord's. Mm. Now, why could he say that? Looking unto Jehovah, who's the author and finisher of his faith. In the New Testament, looking unto Jesus, who's the author and finisher of our faith. He knows he can't beat this, how big this guy is. He got enough sense to know that. But he knows he don't have a covenant. He don't have agreement. And his God is a statue. And David's God is a creator. Mm. Mm. Now, here's something else. When the king told him, he said, I'll go out and fight this Philistine. How do you keep your courage level up? Just never forget past victories. Write that down. They strengthen you for future conflicts. What did David rehearse to Saul? David knew he didn't look like a king. He knew he wasn't big as Goliath. He said, but I want to tell y'all something. Y'all think I've been smoking dope on the backside of this mountain with these sheep. And maybe I did a couple of times, but the Lord loved me. Who knows what David did behind there? <laughs> well, bless God. This man was snorting cocaine on the Bible and God was, nobody else would teach him. So the Holy Spirit had to come down there and talk to him. You know, they wouldn't accept me neither because I was, I was a rocker like, like, like Wayne was. They said, oh no, we don't want him. Hair too long. You know, most people that say that ain't got no hair. <laughs> you, just, you got envy and strides because you ball, sucker. <laughs> and not by choice. But, hey, but you can fix that too. You can fix all that stuff up. So now people will criticize you if you fix yourself up. They can criticize you if you get a facelift. Why would anybody get mad about that? You lose your teeth, you get false teeth. What's wrong with that? I mean, you don't want to walk around with people privy. They lose their hand in your mouth. You go, no, just get some teeth. Oh, get some teeth. If that's, if that's what you want. If you don't want it, that's fine. Never forget past victories. They strengthen you for future conflicts. What do you say? I'm saying this. Hey, Saul, listen to me. I had a herd of sheep to protect him. My daddy beat my brains out if I lose one of these sheep. He don't like me much, but I love him. Let me show you something different. David said, they say, he said, who, 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 who's your father? He said, my, my, my dad named Jesse. Man, David, you know, he loved his father, but his father didn't talk too much about him. He said, but I want to tell you something, Saul. I had a bear come out. I had a lion come out. See, now he's rehearsing his past victories. Now he figured a lion could take out Goliath. It's going to be a pretty good fight if Goliath killed this lion. And a bear, now a bear is just as big as Goliath. 
maybe bigger in those days and times. I don't know. He said, I'm just letting you know something. I can handle this. Have no fear. David's here. No problem. What you going to do? I'm going to throw a rock at him. Now, you know what Saul's thinking? He's going to make him matter, man. He, the guy's going to get madder. I thought the same thing one time sitting in a, in a pickup truck with Willie George and Kenneth Copeland in a hailstorm in Oklahoma doing a movie. I ain't, I'm from South Louisiana. We don't know what a hailstorm is. We don't get hailstorm down not New Orleans. Uh, nothing. Very, very seldom that, that would ever happen. That's to be a freak thing of nature. I'm telling you one thing. I had John Copeland walking around with a shovel on his head and the ice beating the fire at the shovel. And he comes up and asks this wonderful, intelligent question. Is this a rap? I said, the hailstone done hit John in the head. It got to be a rap. We can't go out there. I'm telling you, I have ne and I've never heard a hail hit a call like that in my life. Actually, a truck. Bam, bam. And Brother Copeland's in the front. I'm in the back. I'm thinking, my Lord. And there's a, they said there were 11 tornadoes on the ground in Oklahoma. I thought, there got to be some devils in Oklahoma. All them tornadoes. What are all that destroying <laughs> I'm sitting in this truck. I'm not ready. I'm not, hey, I've been around hurricanes. I ain't gonna sit in this truck and let something just beat my brains out. And all of a sudden, Brother Copeland got a, I don't know, he just got a revelation. He sticks his finger out that truck. He said, devil, I said, stop it. I said, stop it. I said, I wanted to say, Kenneth, you're making him mad. Leave him alone. <laughs> We're in trouble here. I said, stop it. And I felt like saying, that goes for your cat, too. <laughs> so, man, I wanted out that truck. I've never been in anything like that in my life. I've been in hurricanes. Lord, Jesus can't stand up. Man, that hail or something. Well, he was rehearsing past victories. Because I heard him say one time he told a tornado or whatever, a little twister, to get back in that cloud when he was flying. So he's just rehearsing past victories. They strengthen you for future conflicts. Why? Ne write this down. Never leave anything undone that might glorify God. Have you left the church and you left things undone? You didn't glorify God. See, what you start, you finish. Never leave things undone that might glorify God. Because remember, this is a Broadway play. This is drama. This is violence. This is sex. This is jealousy. This is enviness. This is the play man and the actors change by generation. What have you left undone that could have glorified God because you thought somebody might get mad if he did? God told me to stand up. I'm going to say it again. God told me to stand up for the hundredfold return message because that is what will touch this world. It will build your buildings debt free. It will get your people out of debt. It will help you. It's impossible. I know that. So don't do it. Just believe it. It's not your ability. To, God ain't asking you to produce it. Let me go back to that. He's only asking you to believe that he can do his job. That's it. That's a simple thing, isn't it? I mean, that's a very, very simple thing. Yet, wonder why people struggle so much with that. But well, you don't. How, how many times? How long will you stay in line to get healed? What's the difference? You, you don't get healed. At first, you don't get the manifestation. You still gonna let's go and get my healing. Well, so you sowed a seed twenty years ago and hadn't come back yet. Well, bless God, you ain't dead yet. Come on, let the elevator go to the top. If you do it with faith, do it with money. Because that is what all of you need to complete your destiny and reach your destination. You need that. If not by you, but God sends somebody to put it into your hands. Rick, that's the reason why you was worried about leaving Tulsa. And partners help you, man. I don't want to lose my money, my financial base. I understand that. That's, that's a perfectly understandable thing. You see what I'm saying? Why does people fight that so much? Well, it's not scriptural. It's in red. How many reds do you have to have to believe this? It's a metaphor. Well, bless God, get some metaphor. <laughs> is lands, houses, sisters, brothers, is that metaphors? That's physical things. But here's the other part I don't like with persecution. So you mad at me? I'm going to just go to the bank. You, I just go to the bank and say, beat me. <laughs> Beat 
but I'm going to complete my destiny. Well, we don't like you, Jesse the Plant. Yeah, but you don't understand. God loves me. He's seen qualities in me you don't see. See, most people only see my humor. Oh, they don't know what's inside this man. Oh, they don't know, son. Oh, you have no idea. Is that arrogance? No, no, that's confidence. I had a man jump my case in Thanksgiving. Uh, you and that Kenny Copeland, that Jerry Seville, and that Creflo A. Dollar Jr. That's when you can tell a real man when they start giving you the initials. <laughs> that Dr. Lee Roth Thompson. Y'all talk about that debt free stuff, that just arrogance. I said, Excuse me, sir. I said, Let me help you here. Because I knew I'm dealing with a ball with a broke elevator. <laughs> he thinks he's smarter than me. I done left this bar's intelligence years ago. I just smile at him. Now, you think that's arrogance. No, that's the truth. I said, sir, this is not arrogance. This is peace. Possession of adequate resource. Nothing broken. Nothing missing. We're not bragging. This is not arrogance, sir. This is peace. We go to bed in our house knowing no one can take it. You go to bed in your house and your mattress has a mortgage on it. You come to my ministry, no devil can take it. No government can take it. Nothing. We owe nobody nothing but to love them. Is that arrogance? No, no. That's peace. Thank you, Jesus. Giving God the glory, knowing that we could never do it, but God in us could. God in us could. A leader or person who is not passionately committed to the cause will not draw much commitment from others. Are you passionately committed to the cause? God called you. David said, is there not a cause? He's passionately committed to it. Yeah, but you might die. Okay. I'll come back. Devil's killed a lot of people, but the battle ain't over. They're coming back. They're coming back in the same body that died with cancer, diabetes, tuberculosis, high blood pressure, crippling off the rise. The devil's going to say, didn't we kill that guy in 1982? I'm back. You want some of me? They're coming back. You can't kill a Christian. They come back. Jesus said in Revelation 3.15, you can go read these things. I'm doing as quick as I can. Listen to the point for it. A leader or a person who is not passionately committed to the cause will not draw much, atten- much commitment from others. What is God's reaction to non-commitment? See, you've got to find out, what would God think if I disobeyed? I mean, if you're going to look at the picture, if you are going to disobey, you might want to figure out what he might think about it or what he might do about it. He said this, Revelation 3.15, I know thy works. Thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that I were cold or hot. Why? He said, if you lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. God will spit you quick. All you all to him is a big loogie. That's kind of gross, but that's the truth. <laughs> hey, took care of that, Jack. Because you know what it means to be cold or hot? If you was cold, is it possible, and you became lukewarm, is it possible you were heading for hot and you stopped? Or were you just screaming hot and you start listening to people and you start getting warm? He said, I would prefer you never to got hot or never tried to get hot. I would have preferred you to be just flat cold than some lukewarm thing. My wife loves coffee. Women are such powerful people. God, man, I thought we were strong when I strong. I find in all the houses I've been in, you only find one, maybe two rooms that belong to the man. The rest belong to the woman. We're staying at Brother and Sister Copeland's home. I guarantee you, walk into that house, they ain't gonna see nothing of Kenneth Copeland in the foyer. <laughs> Gloria controls that whole house. He, Brother Copeland got very little square footage. <laughs> it's all Gloria. You come to my. <laughs> well, I'm gonna stay next year. I love Jesus. <laughs> but that's a wonderful thing. You come to my house, there ain't nothing much of me. I gotta study. That's it. Everything else is gathered. You go to Jerry's house. Jerry studies back in the back. <laughs> you go to anyone's home. You go, I've been to Happy and Genius. He ain't nothing happy. Happy got to study. And he's trying to do what he wants in his study, but his wife won't let him. <laughs> he said, I just want to paint this. No, you ain't painting nothing. Okay, okay, okay. They totally, we're totally controlled by women. Completely. They got power. They're not the weakest sex. That's what they're using to make us do what they want us to do. That's 
That's why that lady said, teach him. How, how many of you men know what I'm talking about? You feeling romantic at night? You're in that bed. You feel like the Lion King, Mustafa. <laughs> you think, but women have a totally different concept. Watch it. Because they individuality. See, it's the same thing, man. They, they, they understand. They go, wait, 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 wait. No, you don't understand. You say, hey, honey, what's up? Hey, let me talk to your mama. You start reaching over there. And the women, women have such great control. They said, no, nah, let's do it tomorrow. <laughs> Look at the ladies. I can't believe you said it because it's true. <laughs> you don't understand something about a man's makeup. There's these little bitty lion kings in him going. Gung, 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 gung. He, got, he got the African column. Gung, 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 gung. He's ready. But not her. Ah! Tomorrow. Okay. And he ain't gonna sleep. Every two hours he wake up. <laughs> he, he looks over there and says, yeah, shit. That's safe. And you say, woman, this is the Lion King. I'm Mustafa. It's true. Man, four o'clock now. Six o'clock. How many times you reached over and turned the lamp on? What time the clock say? Just waiting for tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow. I love you. Tomorrow. It's the truth. It's the truth. Finally, she goes, ah. You act like you've been sleeping. Oh. Oh. But she done forgot. She gets up. There's the Lion King in the bed. Oh. Trying to get a roar out here. Hey, girl. Then she remembers. Oh. I, I, I got to go to the bathroom. Okay. But then when they come out the bathroom, they head for the coffee pot. They, they find little things to do waiting on them. You don't care how ugly she is. You ain't worried about that. You're just thinking, tomorrow is today. You understand? Ladies, I'm trying to help you. So fine, you're going, hey, hey. She says, I'll be in there in a minute. She comes back out. You're thinking, talk to me, mama. You got your mane out? You looking like some bad boy. She gets right close to me. She says, oh, I forgot something. Excuse me. Oh, I forgot. Wait, wait. I can't my breath. Wait just a minute. you think, I don't care if you got sewage on your teeth. Come here! <laughs> then you think, she goes, oh no, no, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> By that time, your main You want to be Tarzan. You're just looking for Jane. Finally, she comes. Okay. And you got to go through coffee, toothpaste, <laughs> mouthwash. You think, Lord Jesus, this is a whole buffet of bathroom stuff. I can't believe I did this. I can't believe it. Here's the point. Hang on. Here's the point. Here's the point. Here's the point. 
coincidence with God. I know exactly where I'm at. And none with those who commit their way unto him. You might think I'm an accident. Your people may think you're an accident. But you people may think, bless God, you're not called to preach. You're just an accident going somewhere to take place. No, no, no. No, no. Because see, you're judging from the outside. You don't know what's happening on the inside. Mm. There are no accidents with God and none with those who commit their ways unto him. How do you know that? Proverbs 3.13. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. Happy. Have you seen me sad lately? Have you ever saw me sad? I found wisdom. I know what to do. I can build buildings like this debt free under budget. I can do it. I've done it. I can do it again. Arrogance. No, 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 no. Ain't got anything to do with arrogance. Confidence. See, but you got to be willing to do some things you never thought you would do. You got to be willing to step off in the concrete when it's wet. You got to be willing to grab a shovel with the guys that are spreading concrete. You got to be willing to let them see that character. You got to arouse that enthusiasm. You got to nourish that courage. And all of a sudden, they're building God's house and they go, My God, man, if the owner, because they call you the owner even though you're not, if the owner, if the guy's willing to step off in the concrete, if he's willing, my God, to help you sheetrock and do some drywall, I mean, that's a good guy. I'm going to do the best I can for him. Are you willing to do that? Or have you arrived and you can't? And then you pay over your budget. And your contractor cons you. God never calls us to do something silently. Write that down. Let me hurry. I, I, I don't want to go into your lunchtime. Can I finish this real quick? I went a little long here. God never calls us to do something silently. He calls us by a voice. Samuel. Sam. Sam. What? See, have you heard the voice of God or have you heard someone else talking about hearing the voice of God? I believe Oral Roberts heard the voice of God when God said, I will, you will take healing to your generation. He did. Don't tell me this man can't. Just go to Tulsa and look. Don't be stupid. Go look. Go look at the prayer tower. Go look at the, probably a billion dollars worth of assets, if, not, if maybe more. I don't know. Look what faith can build. Now, you see, you can't just, you, you don't do that on someone else's revelation. Jerry could never have built what he's done for his ministry only on Brother Copeland's revelation. Uh -uh. God had to call it. Yes, we use those revelations, everyone. But my God, man, you better hear this voice or you will not complete your destiny or reach your destination. In the Old Testament, God seemed to work in three voices. The burning heart, the burning bush, the burning house. It seems like in the Old Testament. What is the burning heart? David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. That's a burning heart. There's nothing like the heart of a volunteer. God, man, you got somebody volunteer because they're not asked to. In World War II, we were attacked so ferociously by the Japanese. And when men were dying in oil and grease and Pearl Harbor and Hawaii, and FDR, which I was not born then, I was born in 1949. It happened in 1941, December 7th. I remember my grandpa talking about that. I remember my daddy. Oh, it was a terrible time. Then I would experience it in my lifetime on September the 11th when I would see men and women die. And, what, and I don't mean that to negate what happened in World War II, but at least in World War II, it was military. But in 9-11, it was civilian. But see, a life's a life, whether it's military or not. A life's a life. I remember hearing and seeing it. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, all we have, we have nothing to fear, but oh, I believe he said, uh, but fear itself. It was a terrible time. But something had to happen to Japan. They wiped out our Pacific fleet. But what they did not understand, why America is what it is, because the exact Things happened in 1941 that has happened in September 11. It woke up America. You attack one of us, you attack us all. Why? Because we are family. We are. We don't like it. Even if somebody attacks a preacher, we don't like. We may disagree with them, but if they get too hard on them, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's for us to do. No, not for them or you to do. 
That's for God. That's God's business. So what happens? You wake up a nation. And a man came up to FDR and says, we may die doing this. And it may not seem much in the oracles of history. And it may be like a needle stuck into a haystack. And his name was Lieutenant Colonel Doolittle. I will fly a bomber if you can get me close enough to the shores of Japan. I won't have enough to come back. I better learn some Chinese. But it will be a pin prick that will bust right through the very heart of Japan that they are touchable. And Colonel Doolittle did that. And yet in his life, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. Yet he felt he had failed, but he didn't. He drove a sword into Japan. Many died. And his statement came from his lips. Men, we may die. Learn these statements. And he gave him some Chinese statements. He says, because we don't have an, we will not have enough maybe to get back. And then the Japanese seize the ship and they have to fly out 200 miles before they get to the point that now they know they're not getting back. But you know what he said? God, man, this is great. Great men say great things. There's nothing like the heart of a volunteer. Because he's not doing it for himself. He is doing it for the cause. And brother, Japan knew that a sleeping giant had been lifted. That's a burning heart. The burning bush. God will use a surprise approach to get someone's attention. Because <laughs> you're not listening. God couldn't get Moses' attention. He was satisfied with taking care of sheep until a bush starts burning. I will turn and see this great sight. See, that's a voice. God sometimes uses surprise approaches to get your attention. And the burning house, a whole nation is going down because of a devilish person. But a little girl named Esther and an uncle says, you cannot. You must reveal who you are. Let me ask you, pastors, have you revealed who you are? Have you revealed who you are to your church? Are you willing to take that protection off and say, you may kill me, you may shoot me, you may hurt me, but this is who I am? That's what Esther did. What are you saying? The burning house never concealed who you really are. Revealed identity will make you a legendary leader in your lifetime. Are you willing, for lack of a better term, to become naked before man and say, this is who I am? Oh, that's a great quality if you're going to be a king. That's a voice saying a burning call, a burning bush, a burning house. Because if you don't, you're going to lose the whole nation. How could you ever hate a Jew when we serve a Jew? Jesus, always Jewish, yet always Christ. Let me say this in close. The power of influence will outlast a person's physical lifetime when committed energy is there. Elisha received so much committed energy from Elijah that he raised someone from the dead when he was dead. The influence of Elijah was on Elisha years after Elijah had been taken away. Is your, will your influence go beyond your lifetime? I know Dr. Roberts's will. I know Sister Evelyn's will. I know Kenneth will. I know John. And I know yours will too. How do you know that? Because the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Do you understand what that means? That when we stand at this great bar of judgment called the judgment seat, which is the bame of the platform, not a place where God beats your brains out. And angels clap wings and clap hands because of the work you've done. And you think, oh, I've already done with just pastor 50 people. Oh, but how many people can say they brought 50 people to heaven 
They babied them. They changed their diapers. They helped them in adolescence and they brought them to full maturity and grown age. <laughs> the power of influence would outlast a person's physical lifetime. Why is that? Everything in life is forming a purpose. Never be anxious to invent your own ways. I'm not a counselor. I don't counsel. I now I have built a place. I don't even pastor this church. And you know what? I've had some people say, just I want to come preach. I'm going to let that pastor make that decision because I respect his call and his gift. Even though he works for me, I respect him because I don't know how to counsel. I got a three point way of counseling. You counsel with me, <laughs> admit it, quit it, forget it. I get out of here. I had a friend of mine tell me that, just bless me. Admit it, quit it, forget it, go on. That works for me. But you know that does not work for you. Don't criticize me. If I believe in admit it, quit it, forget it, get out of here. Don't criticize me. I don't have your gift. I don't need to. You are my gift. I am your strength. You are my strength. We're a painting. If you take pieces of it out, it's incomplete. So I don't have that gift. I just tell people, admit it, quit it, forget it, get on out of here. But Pastor David, Lord Jesus, come here, sweetheart. That man is my gift that God has given me. That helps me. Because you see, never focus on your strengths. Focus on your weaknesses. Because your greatest weaknesses will stop your greatest desires. Not now, but the day will come when you'll quit looking at yourself and start looking at where God really wanted you to be. And all of a sudden, I want to build a house of God. And David's greatest weaknesses stop this greatest desire. I want to build your house, God. Can't, David. You're a woman chaser. You murdered a man. But I got it in my heart. I know. But you can't do that. Moses. I want to go over. I just want to eat one of them grapes. You can't Moses. You wouldn't deliver it from your people. Let me say this. Most of us want to sit next to Jesus at the banquet. But nobody wants to help him clean out the basement. It all starts in the basement. It starts in the basement. You will get to the table, but you got to start in the basement. Why? I don't know. It's just simply his plan. Because you see, if you start at the table, you're going to embarrass God and embarrass yourself. What are you saying? Most of us want to sit next to Jesus at that banquet table. Oh God, I, I see the works of a Kenneth Copeland, of a Dr. Roberts. I'm amazed. I just, Lord Jesus. But you know what? They're my gifts. Let me shock you. You know who built a war? You? Me. You. Dr. Roberts. Why? Because we family. When my brother want to fight, I want to fight. And I didn't even know the guy he fought. But everyone knew that my brother Wayne whipped that boy and that's Wayne's brother, Jesse. I won too. Yeah. If the suit don't fit, it's not yours. Take it off. Don't be rude. Say, I have not proved this. Goliath was slow, but David was fast. One more thing, and I'll close. Let me get up and pick up my toothbrush and all this stuff. But yeah, thank you, Lord. I have to say, uh, I, I never had the honor of meeting Dr. Lester Summerall. He died before I met him. That's just a little private joke. He called me on the phone. And he says, Jesse Duplantis, I'm Lester Summerall. I said, yes, sir. I have not met you. I said, yes, sir. He said, I want you to do something. I said, well, I'll pray about it. He said, I already prayed. 
I said, okay. He said, I want you to preach my next camp meeting. You understand? I said, when's the dates? He said, does it matter? I asked you. Well, think about it for a minute. The president of the United States called you and you had something to do. Does it matter? <laughs> no. Command the chief's calling, man. Let's go. What would you do if a war started and they draft you? You go, no, no, you don't understand. I'm scheduled. I'm scheduled. Yeah. <laughs> Forget that. He said, I want you here next year. You've got a unique anointing. You have blessed me greatly. You make me laugh. Huh? <laughs> okay. Thank God. <laughs> I said, yes, sir. I will be there. Gave me the date. Thank God I didn't have to reschedule anybody I had that was able to work that in. But he went home to be with the Lord before I got there. And so I never personally met Dr. Lester Summerall. But I did preach his camp meeting, and his influence is just all over the place. He's still there. You will never get rid of me. Never. I will always be there. Isn't that wonderful? Look at people. But he said this to a good friend of mine, Walter Hallam. I always have been preaching Thanksgiving camp meeting for Walter. Good. Oh, I don't know how many years. Always the Tuesday night. And Dr. Summerall looked at Walter Hallam and said this. Take me to your office now. Walter said, yes, sir. Take him by the arm and walk with him. He said, I'm going to tell you how to do big things for God. Do you understand me? Walter said, yes, sir. Take me to the office. Oh, man, he take Brother Summerall to the office. He sat him down. He says, sit down. You know, he talk rough. Sit down. Walter said, I got my pad, Jesse. He said, man, I'm thinking, praise God, man. I'm, I'm going to get me some revelation here. He said, now, are you ready to hear how to do big things for God? Walter said, yes. He said, don't sin. Now, take me to the hotel. <laughs> don't sin. Now, is that Lester Summerall? You knew him. And then a minister asked me the other day, Brother Jesse, how do I do things? How do I do big things for God? So take me to your office. <laughs> he said, I don't have an office. <laughs> I said, and I told him that story. I said, but let me add, let me Jesse rise this. If I can give you, because you see, if I just tell you what somebody else did, I, I can't just give you the gospel. I have to give you myself. That's the book of Thessalonians. Paul said, not only did I come to give you the gospel, but I gave you my own soul. You won't, you got to give some, you got to give your individuality to that person. So they understand why you believe what you believe. And I said, you want to be successful? Yeah. I said, ministers should never have a past. Never. When you step behind that holy place, in that office of that executive branch of God's government, the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teach, when God calls you, many are called for your chosen, when you step in there, remember this, never have a past. Because you see, if you mess up, God will forgive you. That's the love of God. Well, what's wonderful about God, God will forget it. But let me tell you something about people. They will forgive you, but they will not forget it. So don't have a past. That's the summer all. Don't sin. That's what he was saying. Well, since I stepped in that pulpit and God called me, I don't have a past. And I've kept that. Because I will. And I know what people say. Think he would a man think he's staying unless he fall. I know all that. But you see, I also know what lives in me. And I also know, not believe, know that my spirit is stronger than this aggravating flesh. I know that. I ain't believing that. I know that. Don't have a past. If you have one, you will walk with a limp. Oh, you're like, but you're still Jacob. 
the God of different personalities, the God of an Abraham. When you want to be an Abraham man of faith, the God of an Isaac, a little timid. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, wait, don't push the thing. That's Isaac, the fear of Isaac. The God of Jacob, wheeler dealer. He was heaven. Hey, I want that woman. Yeah, okay, hey, do this. But he's still there, God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You can go preach on that. The God of different personalities. So you got to understand there are a lot of people out there like that. But Jacob didn't live, live as long as his grandpa. Jacob did not live as long as his daddy. You know why? He had a past. Don't have a past. When temptation comes your way. Well, think of Mark Barkley's message. Ooh, no. Whatever that may be, money, women, I don't know, whatever tempts you. No. Why? That suit don't fit. That's not my suit, Satan. Give Jesus a hand clap. Oh.